And uh, the truth is, all of us have made some pretty dumb decisions, haven't we? Now, some of you aren't shaking your heads because either one, you don't want to admit it, or two, um, you're just wor worried, why am I moving the chairs? Um, so, uh, but, th but the truth is, we've all made some, some decisions we wish we could take back. Uh, speaking to that, there, are, there was a, a pastor that I talked with. He was a World War II veteran, and uh, I, just, I did his funeral last year. Uh, his wife is absolutely precious, prayer warrior. Um, I went and sat with them often, and um, I said, I, I asked him, I said, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do? And he said, Tim, he said, I would have spent more time with my family. That was what he wished that he would have done, invested. He spent hours, countless hours, starting ministry, helping churches grow, and felt like he had made a decision to invest in other things besides his family. Um, we've all made some, some, pretty, uh, some pretty, de de uh, pretty dumb decisions that we wish we could take back. Um, this morning, I would challenge us that if we could learn to, uh, if we could learn to ask what's the wise thing for me to do, we would perhaps avoid headache and grief. Now, as Christians, sometimes we ask this question, well, sometimes we ask the question, can I do something in another way, which is this, what is the biblical thing for me to do? Now, that's a very good answer, and I, or a very good question, and I wish that more people would ask that question and position themselves uh, underneath the authority of Scripture, um, but, but oftentimes as a pastor, sometimes you play the Bible answer man. Uh, where people come to you, and I, I, particularly um, with young adults, but I've had all kinds of different folks, and they come and they sit in my office and they say, Tim, what does the Bible say about this? And there's a lot of times I go, well, the Bible doesn't talk about that. It doesn't mention that. There, there's no specific reference or verse in the Bible that I could point you to. And so sometimes we think... Uh, that if the Bible doesn't say anything about it, then I'm on my own to make that decision. If we think it, there's no thou shalt not, then it's a thou shalt go right ahead. If God strikes our conscience, then we can simply reply, well, the Bible didn't say anything about it. We think that we're safe as long as we haven't crossed that line. In every level of our lives, in every relationship, in every invitation, in every opportunity, in every situation, the real question is not what can we get away with, but in every situation, the real question should be, what's the wise thing for me to do? This is very different than asking, does the Bible teach against this? I'm going to give you a couple examples. The first one we're all very familiar with. Uh, uh, especially as Nazarenes, alcohol. Okay, so the, if you don't know, now you know, the Church of the Nazarene has a stance, an abstinent stance against alcohol. So the question that I get a lot from young, uh, particularly young adults is, well, Tim, the Bible doesn't say we can't drink alcohol. Didn't Jesus drink wine? And the answer is, you're absolutely correct. Those things are true. Somebody's in trouble. Um, those things are true. But, so the question is, the Bible does say we shouldn't get drunk or we shouldn't be a drunkard. There are specific uh, texts about that. So the question is, is this a limit issue then? Is it, is it a limit issue uh, on, on alcohol? Well, I would invite you to stop asking that particular question and start asking a different question, which is this. In light of my past experiences, like my family history with alcohol, in light of my current circumstances, like my present state of health and responsibilities, in light of my future hopes and dreams that involve the lives of many other people, and in light of what those who would love me the most would attempt to tell me about drinking, what is the wise thing to do in regards to alcohol? I have never heard anybody say this. 
you know what will make my marriage better? If I start drinking. You know what will make me a better father? If I drink more beer. You know what's going to make me uh, more prosperous in my business? If I have more alcohol on hand. Now, some of you go, well, I've seen a lot of business deals done over with a lot of alcohol. Um, that may be true, but here's the deal. Here's what I want to challenge you. This is a wisdom question. The Church of the Nazarene has begun with a very firm stance because we stand in solidarity with those whose lives have been absolutely wrecked by alcohol. And so we choose as believers to say, you know what? We have freedom to do these things. You're absolutely right, Paul. We, have, we can do all things. We, there's, there's all kinds of freedoms. But you know what? We're going to stand in solidarity with people whose lives are absolutely destroyed by alcohol. And that's what we do. So the question isn't what's allowable, what's permissible. Where's the line, Tim? What does the Bible have to say about this? The question that we ask is what is the wise thing for me to do in regards to alcohol? The next one is marital relationships outside of marriage. When you're an adult, and when they're special, and when everyone else says that it's okay. Another way to ask the same question sounds something like this. Has marital relationships outside of marriage ever made anyone's life somehow better in the long run, or has it made the entire situation way more complicated than it ever had to be. Couples living together for long periods of time without being married is becoming more and more prevalent in our, in our culture. And the reason why I'm so adamant about this is because I don't think it's healthy for families. I don't think it's healthy for relationships. I don't think it's healthy for children. I don't think it's healthy for people. To do this. And in fact, it's not just our culture, it's in my own life. Many of my family members and friends have chosen to do this. I am not the judge. Our culture is not the judge. Only God is the loving judge who is filled with wisdom. But the question we need to start asking is what is the wise thing for me to do? In regards to my relationship. You see, marriage is a mysterious and wonderful relationship where a couple's love is sealed by God and blessed by the people who they love the most. It's more than just a ceremony. There's many couples I've sat in front of and they're like, well, pastor, I suppose we ought to get married. Will you do, you know, will you do the I do's? And I want to stop. And I want to say what you're doing is so much more than just saying a few words standing up in front of people. You are literally inviting the presence of a holy God into your life and your relationship and into the way in which you treat one another. You are making a covenant with God and with this other person, sealed by the love of Jesus Christ. This is not just some other service. There is something important that takes place here. Sure, it's scary, and let's be honest, us Christians have not done very well at it in the last recent years, have we? But Scripture is very clear about God's intention for marriage. So we need to learn to ask, in light of my long-term relationships that I have with this person, in light of my present circumstances like children and finances and family, in light of my future hopes and dreams, what do I want from this relationship? What is the wise thing for me to do? You see, once we start asking this question of what's the wise thing for me to do, we begin to boil down to the core of the issue. It begins to expose deep inside what we are all about. It begins to make the decision process much clearer and much easier. Is the decision that I'm getting into right now moving me in a direction that is good and holy and true and righteous? Or is it moving me somewhere else? Or is it taking the energy from that life and moving it somewhere else? You see, when we are used to living in unwise ways, 
we begin to respond to wisdom in three different ways. The first way is this. It's all going to work out. We're, we're approached by wisdom when it comes to, to these types of things, and we say, you, you know, it's going to be fine. I'm not going to be an alcoholic. It'll be okay. I'm not going to get pregnant or some sort of disease. It's not going to complicate my re relationship. It's all going to work out. You're just overreacting. Maybe the second way we respond is saying things like, I know what you're saying. I know you're right, but I just don't care. You know, I, I wouldn't argue that drinking is a smart thing to do, or I wouldn't argue that marital relationships outside of marriage is smart. But when I leave this place, I'm going to do what I want to do. Period. Done. End of story. Another way, when we're used to living in unwise ways, when we hear wisdom and we respond maybe like this, that's exactly what I would expect someone like you to say. You would just impose your morality and your standards on everyone else. You're narrow-minded, you're judgmental. Stay out of my bedroom, stay out of my cabinet, and stay out of my life. Scripture tells us that if we refuse to ask and follow wisdom, we will end up sitting in one of these three chairs. The book of Proverbs calls these people the naive, the fool, and the scoffer. I don't know if they're going to stay up there. Where do we find ourselves when we are confronted with wisdom? If you sit in the naive chair, you'll find yourself thinking that I sound like an overbearing parent. If you sit in the fool's chair, you'll find yourself walking out thinking he's probably right, but I just don't care. And if you find yourself in the scoffer's chair, You'll get mad, you'll zip me a nasty email or a text message, you'll put something ugly on Facebook, and you'll simply never want to ever come back again. So let's talk about these three seats. The naive. Now, I want to tell you that being naive is not a put down. Some people think that. Oh, don't call me naive. It's not a put down. What it means is that you lack experience. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you lacked experience? Absolutely. You think you can handle anything that comes your way because you've never seen any evidence to the contrary. You think everyone is just overreacting. In fact, we read uh, from, from last week, if you remember, in Proverbs chapter 7, we read, For at the window of my house is wisdom is looking at this young man. For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice and I saw among the simple ones, I observed among the youths a young man who has no sense. When we lack experience and knowledge, we lack good judgment. We lack good judgment. Example would be a teenager smoking. In fact, I saw this the other day. I took my kids uh, to the skate park, and there was a kid. He couldn't have been more than 14, 15 years old. Had a cigarette in his mouth. Just thought he was the coolest looking kid on the skate park. Super awesome, super tough. And I looked at him, and I thought to myself, I don't think you're super cool. I think you've never sat next to a person who coughed their lung up because they smoked their whole life. I think you've never been around kids who caught emphysema because of secondhand smoke. I think you've never been and walked with a person who can't walk for more than 20 steps without stopping, gasping for air, because they've put toxins in their body from the very beginning. You see, this young man was a naive person. So what's the biblical solution for somebody who is naive? They need to ask God what the wise thing to do is and live in obedience to that. 
They need to seek out experience. They need to come to find understanding. They need to listen to people who've been down the road a little bit further than they have and learn from their experience. Ephesians 5.15 says, Be careful how you live as wise, not as unwise, because these days are evil. The second chair, the fool, as they say, I know it's wrong, but I don't care. I want to read to you Proverbs chapter 10, verse 23 says, doing wrong is like a sport to the fool, but wise conduct is pleasure to a person with understanding. They become so good at it, it's like, it's like they wonder whether or not uh, they, they can just keep messing up. The fool just does what they want and whatever feels good. Proverbs 26, chapter 11, says this. It says, like a dog that returns to its vomit, that's gross, is a fool who reverts to his folly. They just keep going back and keep going back and keep going back. Keep doing the same unwise things over and over and over again until it erodes every aspect of their life. And if you try to correct them or discipline them or warn them, then they will ignore you. Because there is no new information to a fool. They can be heard saying, I know, I understand, I'm well aware, but I just don't care. There's only one way for a fool to change, the scripture tells us, and that is they have to face the consequences of their unwise decisions. You can't reason with them. You can't bribe them. You can't get their attention. The only, the only when things fall apart do they begin to wake up. And that's why so many of us who have been so foolish are the ones who come to Christ. When we're at the very bottom of the barrel, when we've tried everything there was to be tried, when we've done everything there was to be done, when we've taken advantage of everyone in our life, when we've ignored every warning that there was to ignore, because it's when we find ourselves asking, oh God, what is the wise thing for me to do? That we begin to recognize our need for something outside of ourselves. Now the third seat, the scoffer, it's folded over, it's a scoffer. The scoffer knows what's right and does what they want to, but are also critical of those who are seeking to make wise decisions. We talked about this in Sunday school, in Psalms chapter 1. Um, call them the mocker or the blasphemer. Another name for them is the scoffer. The, you see, the first chair is clueless. They just don't know. The second chair, well, they know, um, but, but uh, they couldn't care less. And the third chair, well, they're just they're critical, critical of everything. A long time ago, the scoffers set themselves up as a crusader against whatever it is. The judge, the jury, of those who are too religious, too puritanical, too narrow-minded in their values. They know it all, and everyone else is wrong. Some of y'all shaking your head like you know somebody like that. Some of y'all looked in the mirror and found somebody like that. You cannot discipline or approach or chastise the scoffer. The scriptures tell us there is only one thing you can do with a scoffer. And I'm going to read it to you in Proverbs 22, chapter 10. It says, drive out the scoffer and strife goes out. Quarreling and abuse will cease. That's pretty heavy. Only thing you can do with them say, get out of here. Because they will continue. You can't bribe them. You can't ask them. You can't beg them. You can't get them to think through things and to perceive wisdom and to perceive reality through that lens. They're just going to, they long ago have made up their mind. 
The naive will ignore wise counsel because they simply don't understand. The fool will ignore wise counsel because they want to do what they want to do. And the scoffer will ignore wise counsel because they want to be in charge. We will come to a point, they, or excuse me, we will come to a point where, uh, where they want to make good decisions, but when they get to that, excuse me, they will come to a point where they want to make good decisions, but when they get to that point, they won't know how. They won't know how. Because they'll look around and they'll realize things aren't going well in my life. The scoffer looks around and says, I'm all alone. Everything I've done has pushed people away. My, my attitude, my anger, my bitterness, my need for control, my need to know it all has pushed everybody away from me. And I'm all alone. The fool will be at the bottom of the barrel realizing every decision that they've made, every warning sign that they've passed, has left them not with what they wanted, but with absolutely nothing to show for it. And the naive, well, the naive will get in so far over their head that they'll look around and hopefully somebody will take pity on them. Hopefully wisdom will look down and smile upon them and they will find some foothold and toehold to find a wise way of living. All of a sudden, the naive person begins to be aware of what they don't know, and the fool begins the process of caring, and the scoffer begins to realize that they need other people because wisdom, uh, because wisdom is what all three of these people actually need. And here's how Proverbs reads about these kinds of situations. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1. Very first one, starting in verse 20, where it says, Wisdom cries out in the street. In the square, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will you scoffers delight in their scoffing? And fools hate knowledge. Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused. Have stretched out my hand and no one heeded. And because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call upon me and I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord would have none of my counsel and despised all of my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the, way of their, or eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices. For waywardness kills the simple and the complacency of fools destroys them. But for those who listen to me will, secure, will be secure and will live at ease without dread or disaster. I want you to know something this morning. I'm not here casting judgment on any one of you. Believe me, I have made my own share of dumb choices. I am not here to tell you what your life, uh, uh, what you should do in each and every situation of your life, but what I want to do, I'm not saying you're a, na a, a knave, a naive. I'm not saying that you're a fool. I'm not saying you're a scoffer. But what I'm suggesting is every one of us in, in, in areas of our lives uh, have areas of our lives where we behave poorly because we have refused to ask the question, what's the wise thing for me to do? And some of us here this morning are stuck. 
are stuck. Because we've been doing it like this for so long. We don't even know what it means to make a good decision. And this morning, I'm here to tell you that as James says, you have because you do not ask. Humble yourself before the Lord and ask God. Invite him into those decisions and in those situations. Invite the wisdom of God to be your partner. Let her become your sister. Let knowledge uh, be, become your intimate friend. I am suggesting that we need to learn to ask the question, what's the wise Thing for me to do because it's very difficult for us to get out of one of these three seats. But God will help us raise up, rise up if we ask one of the primary driving questions. Not what is the allowable, permissible, legal thing? What do I want to do that's going to make me feel good? What are all my feelings in this situation? The question that we need to learn to ask is what is the wise thing for me to do? Our emotions will change. They will. Believe me, you just wait a little bit. Just wait a little bit. And they'll change, and they'll shift, and they'll move. We can't rely on those. Our thoughts about things shift and change. Any of you have been around for a long time, ever change your mind on anything? Tom said, absolutely. Pearl said, I'm changing my mind right now. <laughs> so, if we ask God, not only will he lead us in our efforts to get up out of these chairs, out of these three seats, but he will answer our question. He will answer our prayers. He will make his way known in our lives, and he will lead us in our efforts to become more spiritually mature followers of Jesus Christ. And that is good news this morning. Oh, we're living in a world, people, that needs a good dose of wisdom. We're living in a society and a culture that needs a good dose of wisdom, and we live in an age where the church needs a good dose of wisdom. We live lives where the truth is, sometimes we just get so hard-headed. We get so stuck in our ruts that we forget there's another way. We get so used to thinking that our answers are the right answers. And we stop listening. We get so used to getting what we want that we forget that that's not the most important thing. <laughs> Sometimes we just have never been in a place. I've never pastored a pandemic before. You've never lived in one. And we have to ask the question, what's the wise thing to do? <laughs>